Hi, this is a video to show off the new Microsplat decal system. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to set it up. Uh, I'm going to walk through a lot of the parameters and talk about some of the differences between this and uh, more traditional decal systems. So the first thing we have to do is select the material for our Microsplat terrain and turn on decals. This will recompile the shader with the decal code in it. The next thing we're going to do is set up uh, texture arrays. And uh, basically the way this works is that the decal is computed as part of the shader. So uh, it will need its own texture arrays for the decal textures. And I've already created a config here that I'm going to use, but if you need to create your own, you just go right click to create and you go to Microsplat uh, texture array config. And what you'll see is that the texturing mode here is set to decal. Uh, there's also decal splat map, which I'll get into later. But for now, we're just going to use the decal mode. And then you'll see your traditional like texture array config uh, like you're used to. Uh, but there is one minor difference is that there is no AO channel. Instead, there's an alpha channel. Um, and AO is actually generated from the normal map uh, automatically. Uh, it produces a pretty good result. And so that allows us to reclaim that channel for the alpha data, which is uh, more important for this effect. So I have some various uh, textures set up here for uh, testing on. Um, let's go ahead and create a decal. To do that, you can go to Windows, Microsplat, Create Decal. And then I'm going to move that, select it, and I'm going to move a line with view just to get it into the right location. I'm going to go ahead and zero out its rotation. And you'll notice that it has a pointer on here for a decal receiver. So any Microsplat object can be a decal receiver. Um, so to create, uh, to make it into a decal uh, receiver, what we do is we select our terrain and we add the Microsplat decal receiver component. And now we have our decal receiver and we can select our decal and give it that object to project on. When we do that, a whole interface comes up. Let's just move this down and have it intersect the terrain. I'm gonna make it a little bigger too. Try uh, 50 meters, a huge decal. And you can see it, there we go, decal. And so it'll project onto that terrain. Again, we can move, scale this around. And by default, this is a static decal, but you'll notice that uh, it updates just fine uh, in the editor. It, it, you can actually move the static ones at runtime. Uh, there is a cost to it, and that cost can add up if you have a a uh, train with like lots of decals on it. Um, uh, but there's also a dynamic decal mode which makes that faster. Uh, but before we get into all that, let's talk about uh, the options here on our decal. So we can select which thing we would like to project. And so I can choose one of these like this, um, I don't know, these rocks or this crater and uh, some blood splatters, some other cracks. And then you can uh, take this and you can rotate it, project it however you want uh, onto this surface, uh, onto wherever you want. And um, let me just see if I can get the unity view. There we go. Get my clipping planes better. And so, yeah, you can see how this just projects right onto that surface. And then we have various uh, modes here for blending. Um, so we can choose to blend or multiply 2x with our albedo. And then we can choose our opacity here, and we can turn up and down the opacity of the albedo. Uh, we can choose which type of normal uh, blend we would like to do. Uh, replaces the default, which is basically kind of like alpha-ing the normal. Um, if I turn down the alpha opacity and I'm just doing the normal, you can see how that blends the normal in. And there's also replace our uh, blend mode, which is going to blend the original normal with this normal. Uh, so you'll basically get the normal map of both. You'll get the normal map of the rock or the grass that's underneath it, as well as uh, the, no the normal that's in the texture. Um, so depending on what you're blending with, that can, um, that can sort of change things. And then you also have opacity for the smoothness and AO, uh, which on this doesn't make a huge deal of difference because uh, there isn't a lot in this texture. Um, something like this would be more apparent because of smoothness. Um, and you can see how this texture is just, it's just like a, a blank texture with some 
uh, smoothness value and it's sort of making like almost like a puddle here um, of this green gook. And then um, what else should we talk about here? Oh, you have height blending. And so when that is at one, we're going to use a height blend. When we're at uh, zero, we're going to use a linear blend. Um, that is more apparent on something like this crater. Um, actually, what would be a good one for the height blend? Maybe I don't have a good example for, for height blending here. Um, but if you uh, if you want something to blend based on, on its height map data, uh, you can turn that to one. Uh, most of the time I use alpha blends uh, because you're trying to kind of stick something on, but when you're trying to really integrate with the terrain more, the height blending can be really nice. Um, so that's basically how a decal works. Uh, there's a lot more stuff to cover. Um, uh, this will also, if you have tessellation enabled, will allow you to blend the tessellation with its own offset and blending value, uh, basically changing the displacement with the height map. And then uh, the other option here we have is uh, static versus dynamic decals. You'll notice there's a little red dot here, okay? Um, when I move this around, uh, what a static system, what the static system does is it bakes out this little texture here uh, to basically say where which decals, where uh, the decals are so that we only have to sample the decals that we care about. So if you have hundreds of these on the terrain uh, on every, any given position, you'll only, you'll only uh, basically look into information for four of them, right? Uh, and so there's a maximum of four decals on any given pixel. Uh, but this map is sort of um, a fast way to index into just the four you need instead of, say, looping through hundreds of them, right? Uh, so that speeds things up a lot. It's fairly quick to update this. This map could also be low res, but the resolution of this map controls the kind of the size of those overlaps, right? So if I create another decal here, you'll see that that actually changed to yellow. Uh, because where it's uh, overlapping the other decal, uh, we have two decals and it's storing uh, that index in the green channel. And so uh, when, when we have two, we see yellow. When we have three, it'll turn white. And when we have four, it'll also be white because we can't see the alpha channel. Uh, so it just gives you some visualization of the overlap. So if you make that decal texture lower res, um, it'll be a little less optimal in checking things. Uh, but you may have things that don't quite visually overlap, but they think they overlap because of that uh, resolution. So that can actually be set here on the decal um, receiver. And you can also set it to uh, forcibly generate this map on load as opposed to serializing it. And you can see here that we have two static objects and no dynamic objects. So uh, that's basically how static objects work. Uh, you have some nice display settings here if you decide like, I just, I, you can show all the decals with these boxes, or you can hide them all, or you can um, just show the selected one. Um, so that helps with just kind of scene clutter. Um, you also have a sort order uh, that you can play with. So if you want to make sure that this decal draws over the other one all the time, then you can set the sort order higher, higher and it will uh, make sure to draw over that. So if you switch this to dynamic, you'll see that the color changes to let you know that's a dynamic decal. Everything works the same, but you'll notice down in this little map that we don't have the other object moving around anymore, right? Uh, so dynamic decals have a very different type of cost structure. With a dynamic decal, it's going to compute the decal for every uh, decal. It doesn't look up the textures, but it has to do work for every possible decal on the, on the terrain. But there's no updating this little uh, cache map or anything like that. So they're very fast to move around. And um, basically, if we go back to our uh, microsplat uh, material here, we'll see that we currently have a max of four dynamic decals and 512 static. You can turn these off completely if your game doesn't need them, and that will save processing. Um, on some compilers, 16 or 32 might be the max you can go to. Um, it just depends on your platform. Uh, I let it go up to 64. 64, like, it's going to start to, you know, chew up like a millisecond of time on your GPU 
at somewhere around, I think, 128 of them. So that seemed like where, the, where it started getting really expensive, and I capped it there. It could easily go higher, but again, you're paying that cost for every pixel, regardless of whether a decal is on it. So uh, this is something that you want to uh, use sparingly um, when you're doing things like maybe, maybe you have explosions or something that wants to move around. Um, most of the time, you, you probably set this to none. I default it to four, um, just so that they'll work, right? Um, you have some other options here. You can basically support, you can turn off uh, having it affects the diffuse and normal. Uh, this is if you just want uh, what's called splat map decals, which I'm gonna get into in a second. Um, you can tell it to support an emissive or a metallic map, which you can pack in the texture array config. And then um, you have some other options for whether it affects uh, displacement, whether it should have a per decal tint, so you can tint each of them, and whether it should affect splat maps. So if I turn on effect splat maps, um, let's go ahead and wait for it to compile. Uh, because this shader, because this decal system is running entirely inside the shader, uh, it can affect anything in the shader potentially, right? Um, and so that's really cool. So I have two things that it can affect here that are a bit unusual. The first is that it can affect the splat mapping itself. So you can actually change what textures are chosen for the the terrain uh, based on uh, based on the decal. And so I've already created a splat map array. Uh, which is down here, the splat config. And I have a little splat map in here, and I set that to decal splat map, and it just gives me a splat map. Uh, if you're not familiar, splat map is just an RGBA image with four weights in it. And so um, when I go back to my uh, decal here, um, let's see here. We got that on. Uh, what we can do is go ahead and turn off the effect of this one. So I'm going to turn off all the effect it has on the terrain so it's not doing anything uh, the normal way. And then we're going to turn on effect splat map here. And here we can select which splat map we're using if you had multiple of them. And then we have an opacity. And then we can actually choose different textures. And you can see here that it is actually changing what textures are being chosen on my terrain uh, based on where this splat map is. And I can move that around and it'll affect the actual terrain texturing, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm not exactly sure what uh, people get into with this, but it is a, a pretty neat thing. And then the other option you have here is you can have it affect the stream map. Okay, so uh, if you have the, uh, the puddles uh, wetness puddles streams and lava um, module and you turn on wetness or streams or lava or puddles uh, then you can actually provide a splat map that will modify those values so for instance the red channel would be associated with wetness the green with puddles the blue with uh, streams and the red with lava and if you place this splat map with that on then you would see those effects uh, show up here as well and then, of course, you have an opacity, which is like a weight for all of these that you can turn down um, and, uh, and play with that. So uh, some pretty interesting uh, different kind of techniques you can do with that. And then um, the other thing about this is because it runs in the shader, if I turn on snow, snow will correctly go over these rocks, right? Like it all uh, happens uh, in the shader, so we get the correct ordering uh, of all of our effects. Um, so yeah, uh, what else to talk about? Um, we've talked about the static caching. We've talked about uh, how to set this all up. Um, yeah, so uh, speed. Let's talk about optimizations. Um, on your, if you're using just static decals, uh, then this is very, very fast. Uh, each pixel will query uh, the the this uh, dynamic texture that we're generating here, and then it will uh, look up the splat maps that that refers to. So basically, on all the black pixels, it doesn't look up any splat maps, but on the red uh, pixels, it looks up one of them. 
and then it does the texture sampling and blending for that. So it's very, very cheap, um, uh, you know, using static. Uh, dynamic is a fixed cost per, um, uh, per decal that you allow on the train. Okay, so if you set that dynamic way up to like 64, then every, uh, every pixel will check 64 decals to see if they need to be sampled. And then if they do, sample them. And that can be very prohibitive in terms of uh, time. So it's best to keep dynamic low and rely on static decals. The time to update this, you can see it's pretty interactive. Um, you know, it all updates in real time uh, when they're static. Uh, in game, you know, you can, if you don't have a ton of them, it should work fine. It, it, it's probably fine to move them around. It will be a frame hitch to re-render, uh, but again, you could use a lower res uh, version of this uh, decal receiver map, um, and that would help speed it up. Uh, so I'm using, I have a 512 meter terrain. I'm using a 256 here for it. If you lowered that down to 128, it would render faster and you wouldn't be able to have quite as many decals like packed into a tiny area without them overlapping. Uh, but it'd probably be fine. So, um, so yeah, so you can kind of balance that, uh, as you need. Um, and I'm trying to think there's something else I'm missing. Oh, uh, this also works on, uh, any microsplat object, uh, meshes, uh, mesh strains, etc. However, only di uh, only dynamic decals work. So if you're going to put this onto, say, a building or something like that, uh, you will need to um, uh, you will need to set that dynamic number to enough decals per object. So you know you could set it to four, and then hey, every building gets four decals, and you know you can decorate them as you want. Um, so yeah, that's basically the, the system. Uh, there's some examples of decals uh, in there. You can actually um, get a lot of different effects by playing um, both with the textures and these uh, blending amounts. Um, you can get some, some really different results uh, with how you, how you do it. Um, and yeah, I think that's basically it. Um, you know, you can see that this is mostly from the normal map. Um, and you can see here that if I turn off the smoothness AO, then the smoothness and AO from the rock comes through. Um, so yeah, lots, lots of possibilities with this. Um, the max number of decals on any given microsplat object for, uh, ter for ter static uh, decals, which are only available on trains, the max number is 2048. Increasing this number really doesn't increase much in terms of cost. It's a little bit of memory. Instead of using a, um, I think it's, uh, instead of using a 512 by four texture, it's gonna use a 2048 by four texture to store the information. It might be by eight, I can't remember. So it's a very small amount of memory. So, you know, use lots of static decals, keep dynamic decals low. Um, and yeah, hope that uh, explains it. Uh, if not, there's always the docs and there's always Discord. So thanks for watching.